Okay, we're going to talk about the nephron and answer the questions, what are nephrons, what are renal corpuscles, what are renal tubules, what is the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and why do we care about these things? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton, and I'm the noted anatomist. So here's a list of the four topics we're going to talk about in this video tutorial. Let's start with nephron foundations and begin with an overview of the nephron. So nephrons are considered the functional unit of the urinary system, and there's about one million nephrons in each kidney, and they consist of two parts. There's the renal corpuscle that filters plasma into filtrate. So there's the glomerulus, which is a capillary where plasma then filters through into Bowman space and is now called filtrate. So the nephrons produce 150 liters of filtrate per day, but we only excrete 1% of that in urine. So what happens to all that filtered fluid? Here's the second part of a nephron. They are the renal tubules. And these, what, these tubules convert the tubular fluid into urine through the processes of reabsorption and secretion. So there's the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal tubule, and the collecting ducts. And so as the tubular fluid is flowing through those renal tubules, we reabsorb 99% of the water and solutes back into the bloodstream. And we excrete only 1% of that original filtrate as urine. Let's now talk about five key fluids. And so in this picture, we see plasma. That's the non-cellular component of blood. Then filtrate. This is the name given to plasma after it filters through the glomerulus and podocytes and that name of the fluid now in Bowman space. Next is the tubular fluid. This is the fluid within the lumen of the renal tubules. And so it begins as filtrate in the proximal tubule but is converted progressively to urine by the end of the collecting duct. So there's our fourth type of fluid. And then finally we have extracellular fluid or abbreviated ECF. This is the fluid located within the tissues between the renal tubules and capillaries, and this is why it's also known as interstitial fluid. Now let's talk about four key physiological processes. Um, first is filtration. So filtration is the transfer of water and solutes from the plasma within the glomerulus through that fenestrated capillary and filtration slits into Bowman space. Next, we have reabsorption. Reabsorption is the absorption of water and solutes from the tubular fluid back into the peritubular capillaries or vasorecta, back into the bloodstream, whereas secretion is uh, the secretion of solutes into the tubular fluid. And an excretion um, is when the collecting ducts take urine from the collecting ducts and put them in the calyces and you excrete it to the outside world. So filtration minus reabsorption plus secretion is what equals excretion. Now let's talk about these two types of nephrons. There's two types of nephrons, a cortical nephron and juxtamedullary nephron. Uh, in this section of the kidney, we see the separation of the renal cortex and the renal medulla, like that. And you'll notice a bunch of nephrons in the cortex. These are called, appropriately, cortical nephrons. These are located, nephrons located in the renal cortex and the glomeruli are located in the outer cortex and there's these really short loops of Henle. And so there we see one group of cortical nephrons and another and another and another. These cortical nephrons are, are the major part of regulatory and excretory functions of the human body and that's carried out by these cortical nephrons. Now there's this other right there. It's called the juxtamedullary nephron. This is the glomeruli are right next to the medulla, juxta, next to the medulla. And they have these really long loops of Henle that penetrate deep into the medulla. And this is what establishes the salty medulla that helps us to conserve water in the human body. So there we have cortical nephrons, and they make up about 85% of those million nephrons in each kidney. And then there's these juxtamedullary nephrons that consist of about 15% of those million nephrons in each of our kidneys. And so there are cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons, and there are the collecting ducts that receive tubular fluid from both types of nephrons. These collecting ducts descend in the medulla, and then they dump into the minor calyx.
Now, one more thing about these two types of nephrons. In these cortical nephrons, you see the afferent arterial feeds into the glomerulus and the efferent arterial comes out and that efferent arterial now becomes the peritubular capillaries. The glomerulus is capillary number one, peritubular capillaries is the second capillary around the renal tubules in the cortex and this is where the reabsorption of water in solutes occurs. Now, in the juxtamedullary nephron, the afferent arterial feeds that first uh, capillary, the glomerulus, and the efferent arterial gives rise to the vasorecta, the second capillary around these long loops of Henle in the medulla. This is where the reabsorption of water and solutes occur, but this is also the countercurrent exchanger, which maintains the salty renal medulla. So there are those two types of nephrons. All right, there's topic one. Topic two is the renal corpuscle. Um, and let's begin by talking about the glomerulus, its fenestrations, and the mesangial cells. Now, the glomerulus uh, gets its name for glomus, which is Latin for ball of yarn, because there's the glomerulus, and it kind of looks like a ball of yarn. And it is a capillary lined with fenestrated endothelium. It's filled with plasma, and it is where the process of filtration starts. And it's supplied by the afferent and drained by the efferent glomerular arterioles. So there is the glomerulus in cross section. There are some endothelial cells with those openings called fenestrations. And the afferent arterial feeds blood, which circulates through the glomeruli and exits through the efferent arterial. Now, the afferent and efferent arterials are lined, as with all arter arterials, with smooth muscle. So glomerular filtration rate is regulated mainly by balanced tone of both the afferent and efferent arterials. So this is a systemic capillary, like something you find in a skeletal muscle. There's endothelial cells and there's a basement membrane. It's a capillary, so there's no tunica media or externa. What is a fenestrated capillary? Well, a fenestrated capillary, like we see in the glomerulus, has endothelial cells and a basement membrane. But look, it has all these fenestrations, these numerous openings that are 60 to 90 nanometers in diameter. This is what is going to assist in filtering plasma initially. Now, what are mesangial cells? Where this prefix meso means middle or between, and angus means capillary. So mesangial cells literally means the cells between the capillaries or within the capillaries. So there's the glomerulus, there's the mesangial cells in between the capillaries. And they consist of about 30 to 40% of all the glomerular cells. Now, mesangial cells removed, tr remove trapped residues an aggravated protein from the glomerular basement membrane to keep that filter free. It's also modified smooth muscle cells, so they have contractile properties. Next, we'll talk about the glomerular basement membrane in the renal corpuscle. So the glomerular basement membrane is the basal lamina. It's formed by both the glomerular endothelial cells and podocytes we'll talk about in a second. And it's composed of type four collagen chains and negatively charged heparin sulfate. So we zoom in on this and we see the glomerulus with that little schematic is an endothelial cell and that's a fenestration. Here's Bowman space with a podocyte with the filtration slit opened there. And there is the shared glomerular basement membrane in gray. So plasma filters through the fenestration basement membrane and filtration slit into Bowman space where it becomes filtrate. Let's now talk about Bowman's capsule and Bowman's space. So there is Bowman's capsule, which is comprised of simple squamous epithelium. Deep to that is Bowman's space, or also known as the urinary space. That is what's filled with filtrate. And it looks C-shaped, around, it looks C-shaped around the glomerulus in cross section. Next are the podocytes in filtration slits. So there's Bowman's capsule and there's the Bowman space and there deep are the podocytes. And the podocytes gets its name because like you think a podiatrist, like a foot doctor, podocytes literally means foot cells because these podocytes have foot processes that envelop and surround glomerular capillaries. So there is a podocyte, and there are some of its foot processes, and between them, 
are the filtration slits. So the podocytes envelop the glomerular capillaries with foot processes, and the spaces between the foot processes are called filtration slits. One podocyte, two podocytes, and they're the foot processes, and we go shing, and put it together and that space between them are the filtration slits that are surrounding the glomerular capillary. Uh, nephrologists sometimes use this emoji of a podocyte that's because it's got a cell body in the foot processes and it's kind of cute, isn't it? And it's, it's not so much funny, but it's funny for nephrology. All right, so we zoom in and there's the glomerulus and there's Bowman space and there's the podocyte foot processes and there's a filtration slit between the foot processes. That's maybe 20 to 30 nanometers wide. And between those filtration slits are these transmembrane proteins. One of big one is nephrin that repels negatively charged plasma proteins like albumin. So there's albumin in the glomerular capillary and it goes to be filtered, but it's too big and it's repelled because of the negatively charged um, nephrin. Another view of a podocyte cell body that it has these numerous primary foot processes that give rise to secondary foot processes that give rise to pedicles and the pedicle of another uh, process gives rise to that filtration slit. Now, if we put all these things together, this is what histologists and pathologists will use this jargon. I'm just going to call all of that foot processes in this tutorial. Now, let's talk about the glomerular filtration apparatus. It's kind of putting all these things in the renal corpuscle together. There are three parts. The fenestrated glomerular capillary, the shared glomerular basement membrane, and the podocyte foot processes with their filtration slits. So in this picture, we zoom in to that glomerular capillary with the endothelial cells and their associated fenestrations, the podocyte and foot processes, and a filtration slit. And there's the shared glomerular basement membrane. So plasma filters through a fenestration, the basement membrane, and filtration slit into Bowman space, and it is now called filtrate. So those are that, that shows the three parts of the glomerular filtration apparatus, which ensures the passage of plasma and solutes, like solutes like glucose and sodium, but prevents the passage of blood cells and large proteins like albumin. So filtration is the transfer of water and solutes from plasma through the three parts of the glomerular filtration apparatus into Bowman space. Filtration is powered by energy from the heart, pushing blood through the arteries into capillaries. And it is also governed by Starling's forces like hydraulic pressure and oncotic pressure. All right. So let's zoom in on this H&E stain, and there's Bowman's capsule, deep to which is Bowman space, and then there's all these uh, purple nuclei. And what do these purple nuclei belong to? Which cells? Well, podocytes, glomerular endothelium, and mesangial cells, and it's hard to tell which is which in one section of an H&E stain, but we know that they belong to those three types of cells. Now, what are the two poles of the renal corpuscle? There's the vascular pole where blood enters and exits the glomerulus. And then the urinary pole where filtrate exits Bowman space into the proximal tubule. There are the two poles. All right, halfway done. That's okay, isn't it? Okay, so stand up, stretch, and let's talk about renal tubules next. But before we get started, let's become familiar with the following illustration. We're going to spend a little time with this little baby. There is the renal cortex and then the inner renal medulla. But I want to notice we're going to be showing quantitatively as how we descend in the renal medulla. It goes from 300 to 1200 milliosmol per kilogram. But also quantitatively, look how it goes from yellow to as dark orange to show the increase of saltiness of that medulla. There's our glomerulus with the Bowman space, and then there's the proximal tubule, the loop of Henle, which is shown right there with its three parts. And then there's the distal tubule with its macula densa and the collecting duct, which exits through the minor calyx. So here's the nephron. Now specifically, this is actually showing a juxtamedullary nephron, and I'm focusing on this because there's some really important physiological things that are gonna happen uh, with that loop of Henle 
So I'm going to focus on showing a juxtamedullary nephron to show all these facets of the renal tubules. Now, renal tubules reabsorb 99% of the original filtrate back into the blood. So there is the filtrate, and as it flows through the renal tubules, we see in the proximal tubule in the loops of Henle, we see the reabsorption of water and solutes as we go. And so by the time you reach the end, there's only 1% left of the originally filtered um, filtrate, and 99% of that is reabsorbed. So we have 180 liters of plasma that becomes filtrate every day. 177 to 179 of that is reabsorbed. We excrete 1%. So let's start with the proximal tubule. Um, it's lined with simple cuboidal epithelium with a brush border. And what that means is we look at the simple cuboidal epithelium and look at a cross section, there's a proximal tubule cell and there's this brush border that significantly increases the surface area for reabsorption. So when you look in an H&E stain, there is a proximal tubule cell and showing simple cuboidal epithelium. And all of that fuzziness in the lumen is what happens with the brush border when you stain and take a section. Um, the proximal tubule reabsorbs about 65% or two thirds of water and the following salts, sodium, chloride, potassium, and calcium. The proximal tubule also reabsorbs most of the bicarbonate and all glucose and amino acids. And then the proximal tubule secretes protons, and I put creatinine, I'll talk about that in a second. So there's our proximal tubule with tubular fluid. And we have these transporters that reabsorb sodium and then co-transport glucose, phosphate, amino acids. We have aquaporin-1 that helps with the reabsorption of water. And in the proximal tubule, unlike other parts of the nephron, you also reabsorb water paracellularly between the different cells. We also reabsorb most of the bicarbonate, but we secrete protons and creatinine. Now, creatinine is this end product of muscle uh, metabolism that helps us determine GFR clinically. And there we have our peritubular capillaries in which the reabsorption is going into. So reabsorption and secretion occur because of those transporters, but also a little bit of paracellular movement. I want to make mention of something about reabsorption. There's tubular fluid, and reabsorption takes water and solutes from tubular fluid into the plasma. But notice that there is a middle ground we call the extracellular fluid. So when tubular fluid and solutes are reabsorbed, it goes into the extracellular fluid and then diffuses into the plasma. That concept will become important down the road. Um, now, in the proximal tubule, when sodium and water are reabsorbed, they are done so isosmotically, which therefore the tubular fluid and extracellular fluid and plasma associated with the proximal tubule have the same osmolality. So there we have reabsorption of sodium, and then water follows. Tubular fluid, extracellular fluid, and plasma have the same osmolality. But what is the osmolality? To answer that question, what movie is this? 300. And that's the, it's 300 milliosmol for kilogram is what the osmolality is for tubular fluid, extracellular fluid, and plasma in the proximal tubule. Now let's go to the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle has the following three divisions. We have the descending thin limb, the ascending thin limb, and the thick ascending limb. And these three parts of the loop of Henle are named for the direction of blood flow, or uh, pardon me, the direction of fluid flow, descending or ascending, as well as for the cell type lining the tubule. Simple squamous epithelium we call thin. Simple cuboidal epithelium we call thick. So the descending thin limb is, the, is comprised of simple squamous epithelium with descending tubular fluid. The very key part of this is the descending thin limb is permeable to water, dramatic pause, but not permeable to salts. So as the tubular fluid descends, water diffuses from the descending thin limb to the saltier extracellular fluid. And that's why the tubular fluid initially begins with 300, but is then concentrated to 1200 milliosmol per kilogram deep in the renal medulla. That was fun. Let's show it schematically. So the tubular fluid osmolality is similar to plasma in the descending thin limb. Look at the color in the DTL there at the start. 
and then also in the ex- in the external. Uh, and, but as we descend, water is going to flow to where it's saltier. So, and because it's permeable to water but not salt, water is going to be diffusing from to water follows salt. And so through aquaporins, or in some cases paracellularly, water flows. And because surrounding uh, the extracellular fluid is increasingly hypertonic and the salts res- remain in the descending thin limb, by the time we get to the bottom, the tubular fluid osmolality is highly concentrated. Look at the color inside the descending thin limb and in the interstitium. Now, the ascending thin limb is simple squamous epithelium with ascending tubular fluid, and it arises from the renal medulla and ascends until we get to the thick ascending limb. And this is where some other significant things happen. This is simple cuboidal, thick, and the tubular fluid is ascending, and the thick ascending limb is permeable to salts through the NKCC2 cotransporter dramatic pause, but not permeable to water. There are no aquaporins and there's really tight junctions between these cells. So the thick ascending limb creates a highly concentrated, salty extracellular fluid in the renal medulla. So what we see in the thick ascending limb is it reabsorbs sodium through those NKCC2 transporters, but not water. So it creates a salty medullary interstitium This is then going to potentially concentrate urine in the collecting ducts. More on that later. And because we're reabsorbing salt but not water, the fluid leaving the thick ascending limb is always hypotonic compared to plasma. And so the NKCC2 transporters are targets of loop diuretics. Um, And then we see the reabsorption of magnesium and calcium actually paracellularly in the thick ascending limb. So there we have the loop of Henle. But we don't end there because the loop of Henle and its associated basa recta, they establish and maintain this cortical medullary gradient through these two processes, countercurrent multiplier and countercurrent exchanger. So I'm going to do just an, a little overview of that. What is the countercurrent multiplier? It's the process used by the loop of Henle to create this cortical medullary gradient. So The grating is generated by pumping sodium out of the thick ascending limb and then water following that sodium from the descending thin limb. So here's the thick ascending limb. And as tubular fluid ascends, sodium is pumped into the extracellular fluid. Then there's the descending thin limb. So as tubular fluid descends, water diffuses towards the salty extracellular fluid. And what we see is sodium from one side is pulling water from the other. That's what creates this increasingly concentrated interstitium in the medulla. And as fluid moves through the loop of Henle, these two steps are repeated over and over. They're multiplied, causing the osmotic gradient to steadily multiply until it reaches a steady state. Now, I didn't show the multiplication process. That'll be in a future tutorial, but the Uh, But basically, the gist of it is shown here. This process is essential for kidneys to concentrate urine and retain water. Now, let's talk about the countercurrent exchanger. This is the process used by Vasa recta to maintain the cortical medullary gradient that was created by the loop of Henle. So here we have the loop of Henle, and there's the vasa recta. This is a capillary. It's got blood in it, or plasma. And as, and as with all capillaries, it's permeable to water and solutes like sodium. So as sodium flows into the vasa recta and water flows out of the vasa recta, so as the plasma descends, sodium goes from high concentration, interstitium, to low concentration into the blood, And then water flows out to where the increasing saltiness is. And we see this process. And so the osmotic gradients between the blood and the extracellular fluid is continually equalizing until we do this hairpin turn and now we go in the countercurrent the opposite direction. Now sodium flows out of the vasa recta and water flows into the vasa recta. Okay, we have the opposite occurring. So solutes diffuse in as 
plasma flows down and then solutes diffuse back out again as it countercurrents in the opposite direction. This mechanism prevents the washout of solutes and it represents the endless circulation of solutes in and out of the vasa recta and the medulla. So, in a nutshell, the thick ascending limb pumps sodium into the uh, renal medulla. The descending thin limb is permeable to water and water follows after it. This is the countercurrent multiplier. This is what establishes that cortical medullary gradient. Here's a vasa recta with plasma as it descends, sodium diffuses into the blood. And as plasma ascends, sodium diffuses back out again. This is the countercurrent exchanger. This is what maintains that cortical medullary gradient. Now, the renal medulla receives significantly less blood flow than the renal cortex, and therefore, the medulla is sensitive to hypoxia and is increasingly vulnerable to ischemic damage. Okay, now let's talk about the distal convoluted tubule. Um, the DCT reabsorbs about 5% of the sodium and chloride, and it does it through these NCC transporters. And then the distal tubule reabsorbs calcium when under the influence of parathyroid hormone. But also in the, uh, not but, in addition, in the distal tubule, we have this macula densa. It's where the distal tubule touches its, parents, its parent glomerulus. It's part of the RAS system. And then aldosterone stimulates ENAC in the distal part of the distal tubule and in the collecting ducts, which helps to reabsorb uh, sodium when the body needs it. So there is the thick ascending limb. Now watch as fluid then uh, moves through the distal convoluted tubule until it hits the collecting ducts. And as the fluid flows through, the NCC uh, transporter reabsorbs sodium and chloride, and this is what reabsorbs about 5% of the sodium chloride, further diluting the tubular fluid. Look at the tubular fluid at the distal part of the distal tubule. It's now uh, white almost, and now compare it to the surrounding interstitium. NCC transporters are the target of thiazide diuretics. So at the distal part of the distal tubule, aldosterone will target these cells and that causes ENAC to then um, fuse into the lumen, luminal part of the apical membrane, and that helps to reabsorb sodium. There, those cells that are part of the distal tubule touching the parent glomerulus are the macula densa cells. And so there we've got in yellow the distal tubule and you see it touching the parent glomerulus. That's the macula densa. It's where the distal tubule touches its parent glomerulus right there, these specialized cells. They're part of the RAS system. More on that later. Now the collecting ducts. Collecting ducts receive uh, distal tubules from numerous nephrons and then connects them to a minor calyx. So here are a bunch of uh, nephrons and there are they all going into one collecting duct and then you see the urine going into a minor calyx which then goes to a major calyx and all the major calyxes become the pelvis, the renal pelvis and it goes out the ureter. And in this H&E stain, you can see some collecting ducts. Probably at that point, they'd be considered papillary ducts where a bunch of collecting ducts come together and they dump into the renal calyx. There's the bottom of a renal pyramid. Now, collecting ducts are impermeable to water in the absence of ADH. And collecting ducts are impermeable to salts in the absence of aldosterone. So, collecting so reabsorption in collecting ducts depends on regulating hormones as well as the needs of the body. ADH will activate aquaporin 2, which is going to increase water reabsorption. Aldosterone will activate ENAC, which increases sodium reabsorption. So what we're going to do in these succeeding slides is demonstrate what happens in a collecting duct when we don't have ADH, or when we do have ADH, or when we have aldosterone and ADH. So let's begin with out ADH. With no ADH, there are no aquaporin 2s in the distal tubular collecting duct. If there's no aquaporins, there's no water reabsorption, which means the collecting duct tubular fluid remains very dilute and maximally dilute urine is excreted. 
So there's the distal tubule, and there's the NCC transporter that reabsorbs sodium. So at the distal part of the distal tubule, we have a very dilute, hypotonic urine. And as that, or, or, or let me say that again, tubular fluid. As that tubular fluid flows into the collecting ducts, it's very dilute, but there's no ADH, there's no aquaporins, or there's no aquaporins, there's no water reabsorption, and so we excrete this maximally dilute urine. Now look at the color of the tubular fluid all throughout the collecting ducts. It's white, it's clear. Now compare it to how concentrated the interstitium is. So this is now what we see what happens with ADH. Now ADH, antidiuretic hormone, is going to stop us um, from urinating, getting rid of the water. So what happens is ADH causes these aquaporin 2s to insert in the distal tubule and collecting ducts on the luminal surface. This enables water reabsorption and water moves from tubular fluid to extracellular fluid until osmolality equalizes. And this is where maximally concentrated urine is excreted. So watch, ADH is inserted and these aquaporins, uh, pardon me, ADH targets these cells and the aquaporins cause a reabsorption of water. Now watch that every time we have these aquaporins, thanks to ADH, and water is reabsorbed, look at the fluid inside the collecting duct compared to the outside interstitium. Water keeps flowing until the tubular fluid in ECF equalizes. And that's why we excrete a maximally concentrated urine in the face of ADH. Now, what about aldosterone and ADH? So, aldosterone stimulates ENAC in the collecting ducts, and that increases sodium reabsorption. Now, if ADH is present, which it usually is in typically because aldosterone is released from the adrenal cortex because angiotensin II targets the adrenal cortex, and if there's angiotensin II, causes aldosterone to be secreted, but it also targets the hypothalamus and pituitary to release ADH. So if ADH is present, water follows sodium, and the net effect is retention of fluid. That's roughly the same osmolality as the body fluids. So aldosterone targets these cells, ENAC is inserted, and you reabsorb sodium, and then you have aquaporins, and water follows. Aldosterone, ENAC, sodium reabsorption, water follows. And so uh, that sodium and water go into the, inter the extracellular fluid and then into the plasma. And so water follows sodium. Therefore, tubular fluid osmolality equals body fluids. Tubular fluid, extracellular fluid, and plasma. All right, let's conclude with juxtaglomerular apparatus. These are three types of cells in the vascular pole of the renal corpus of the renal corpuscle that provides tubuloglomerular feedback to maintain systemic blood pressure and GFR. The three cells are juxtaglomerular cells, the macula densa that we already talked about, and these extraglomerular mesangial cells. Juxtaglomerular cells are also known as JG for juxtaglomerular, or they're known as granular cells because when you look inside these granules are renin. So JG cells produce, store, and secrete renin, which is part of the RAS pathway, renin, uh, angiotensin, aldosterone system. These cells, these JG cells are specialized or modified smooth muscle from the afferent glomerular arterial. They also have these beta-1 adrenergic receptors. So when is renin released? Well, when the afferent glomerular arterial smooth muscle sense a reduced perfusion pressure or when the mac and or when the macula densa senses a decrease in sodium concentration in the tubular fluid and or there's sympathetic innervation of these beta 1 adrenergic receptors next let's talk about the macula densa this is where the distal tubule returns to its parent glomerulus and just review there's the distal tubule and there it touches its uh, parent glomerulus and that's the macula densa okay it monitors sodium chloride concentration in the filtrate or tubular fluid. It maintains an inverse relationship between sodium concentration and GFR via this tubuloglomerular feedback. 
So for example, the macula densa senses a decrease in sodium concentration in the tubular fluid. In response, these macula densa release prostaglandins, which dilate the afferent arterial, increasing glomerular hydrostatic pressure, helping to increase GFR. Then the JG cells release renin that goes through the RAS pathway, and that eventually also causes constriction of the EGA. There is an H&E stain of the distal uh, convoluted tubule and the glomerulus, and there are those rows of cells or the macula densa. Now, mesangial cells, they do some sort of signaling activities for the juxtaglomerular apparatus, but I don't fully understand it, so I'm just not going to talk about it. So there we have our three parts of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. So the nephron, that renal corpuscle, the glomerulus, filters plasma into Bowman's space. The proximal tubule reabsorbs 67% of the filtered salt and water. The loop of Henle reabsorbs 25% more of the salt and establishes that concentrated renal medulla in the juxtamedullary nephrons. The distal tubule further reabsorbs sodium and water and helps to to modify uh, depending if we need dilute urine or not. The collecting ducts reabsorb water if there's ADH and salts if there's aldosterone. And another way of showing that is that when the renal artery supplies the nephrons, the glomerulus goes through the process of filtration and the filtrate enters the renal tubules and that's the proximal tubule loop of Henle down to the collecting ducts. Whereas the plasma continues in the peritubular capillaries and vasa recta paralleling those renal tubules. So reabsorption is taking water and solutes back into the blood. Secretion is putting some things back into the renal tubules. So urine is what's left over at the end of the tubules and plasma exiting just goes into the renal vein and back into the systemic circulation. And that, my friends, is the nephron in a nutshell. Mm -hmm.